to introduce you to David uh, Roylance. I was introduced to David a few months ago and had uh, David was very kind enough to give me a sort of um, a half and I think it was half an hour, was it an hour? It went so quickly, half an hour's uh, sort of session on how to present, start to present myself. And it was really um, interesting actually, because I've actually pre presented quite, um, quite a lot in big groups. So I thought I was doing okay. And it wasn't until he um, had this conversation that I realized that actually just the way that I stand affects my voice and how I sound and how I come across to people. So I now make sure that I stand in a different way and I'm hoping that affects my voice. I realized that I was very squeaky before and I'm not so squeaky now. So thank you for that, David. So David agreed to um, do this session for us and um, has, as, as it was advertised as presenting with presence, um, but I'll pass you over to David uh, to actually sort of tell you as well the other things that he does because he doesn't just do um, presenting. So thank you, David. Over to you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, hello, everyone. I am David Roylance. I'm CEO of Speak to Shine. And at Speak to Shine, our, typically our clients are senior women sort of 45 to 55 inside organizations, probably earning between 80 and 100,000 who they're in the boardroom and they wonder to themselves when they speak, am I actually here? Because 10 seconds later, either they've been trodden on or they're being ignored, <laughs> or there's a man on the other side of the table who has just uh, repeated their idea and then got the credit for it. And so, uh, that's when they usually come to me and typically I help them through this process with my unique system, speak, shine, make 10 times the difference. I help them in order to present themselves in a way that makes a bigger difference for themselves and whoever they're working with. And the end result is six months from our working together, typically they've got themselves a promotion that adds an extra 100 to 150,000 into their income stream. Can I just check in with you? Raise your hand if you'd like an extra 100 to 150,000 in your income stream. Am I just want to know I'm in the right room here. Fabulous. Uh, thank you. So uh, I, I'm for, to begin with, because this is going to be a fast hour. And I don't again, raise your hand if you watch the video that I posted and Diane distributed on LinkedIn before we got to, together super so not everyone fine that's fine the, uh, thank you laura this is going to be a little bit left field because i specifically work with people on the way that their voice resonates in a room and that can be about presenting it can also be about how you present yourself when you are working uh, walking on a corridor or when you have an opportunity to meet someone who potentially could be very interesting to you or if you're running your own business in order to massively upscale the number of people who you want to become clients becoming your clients now to begin with i'm just i'm going to share a screen which has my presentation on it and and uh, once i've shared it i'd like you to give me a thumbs up if you can see what i am sharing with you right now can you can you give me a thumbs up that you can see it thank you diane so here we are the theme of this year's international women's day is challenge yourself challenge yourself by presenting yourself with presence. And the first thing is I'd say thank you for giving yourself a gift this International Women's Day. And that gift is being here in this room, working on your career rather than in your career. Because if you want to make something different, who, who'd like to make something different happen in their lives? other than that which is going on now. Who'd like to massively increase their level of influence that they have when they speak? Fabulous, because the truth is that, well, 
I'm going to do something a little bit left field here. And my question to you is, is, is it worth doing something a little bit left field in order to have better results? As my mentor said to me for many, many times over the last seven years, they've said, David, you can either have pleasing methods or pleasing results, but you can't have both. So my question to you is, is it worth trying something a little bit different and a little bit left field in order to find out if you're going to get better results? Because everything that you want is on the other side of fear. It's never going to be easy. Anything that you want to have that you do not have now, you can only have on the other side of fear. And when it comes to presenting, the fear that most often shows up is the fear, I am not enough. And I don't know if, you know, w women are more likely to own up to imposter syndrome if they've got it. And so who, who here has ever had that thought? I don't know that I'm enough. I don't know if I'm good enough. Yeah, and, and so approached maybe something that's coming towards you, like an opportunity to present or pitch or pitch an idea where you've had that thought, am I good enough? Do, do I deserve to be doing this? Do, the, do these people want to hear what I have to say? My guarantee it's on the other side of that fear, which is, am I enough? And the truth is, you are, because everyone is enough if they choose to believe that they're enough. So my next rule of engagement, if you like, is ask lots of questions. Yes, we'll have an opportunity towards the end uh, to collect questions and answer them, but I want to make sure that you get something in this next hour that works for you to go away and do something different because we spent this lunchtime together. I want you to actively have something you can physically do differently because we spent this time together. So make sure you do ask the questions. The only stupid question is the one you didn't ask. And then for the next hour, please be focused, be here in this room, put, put away your phone or turn it onto silent. Don't get, go, don't get involved in social media. Be here because that focus is your gift to yourself. And Remember, I want to give you something to do. Action changes things. If all we do for the next hour is have a nice chat together where you learn something new, but you don't actively do anything different with it, then nothing will change for you. And it breaks my heart over the years that I've worked with hundreds of women and changing their lives and changing the, the level of influence they have, changing the level of income they bring home, to see the ones that self-sabotage because they don't do anything actively breaks my heart every time. Energy equals success. So the more energy you've got, and I know this from the years, I've spent the last uh, seven to 10 years hanging around with people who are significantly successful and uh, you know, and a number of whom are millionaires. And one thing I've noticed about spending time with millionaires and billionaires is they've got more energy than most people. We know that energy equals success and energy is a defining aspect of you being in charge of what people see, hear and experience when they're in a room with you. So let's have more energy. Let's be more energized. Today, we're looking at how you can present with presence in order to increase your influence by getting your voice heard. And so we're going to work today on the three pillars of impact. The three pillars of impact are posture, voice, and energy. You know, I had a chance um, before this meeting, spend a little time with Diane working specifically on posture because it's always got to start there. And today we're going to do an exercise on each of these three elements of impact. The three pillars of how you take charge of how others see, hear and experience you. Now, okay, so I, I, here's me laying out my stall of what it is that I do and how I help my clients. I'd like to know, because something brought you to this room today, in order that we spend this next hour together, can you put it in the chat box? What is it you would like to achieve in this next hour? What would you like to have that you can walk away with? 
after two o'clock, you can actively do something with. So please put that in the chat box because it's all very well. I know I've, I've prepared a slide deck and everything, but I, pre I prefer to work with the people who are actually in the room. I want to find out what's going on for you, the people who are in this room so I can help you change your experience. So Sarah, have we had anything in the chat box? That I see a couple of things have come in, but I can't yeah. quite see them. You've much. got a couple of things. I think two people agree. Diana said a very valid one, which I agree with as well. How do you stop saying, um, which yeah. Rachel agrees with? Um, and Emily has joined us and she's got a really good question. She said, how to have more faith in myself in work no more imposter syndrome and to, to conduct myself with more authority. Um, Laura said, how can you come across as more confident and effectively get your point across? Um, John's come back with marginal gains, small tweaks and tips to mm -hmm. make more of an impact when presenting. Yeah, Emma Sheila's has come back and said, present with confidence. Laura agrees with us all definitely with the imposter syndrome. So I think yes. a lot for you to go at, really. Wonderful. I'd better get on with it, Sarah. Yeah, nice. I? Yes, definitely. Uh, fabulous. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so a little quote from Mr. Einstein here, that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we create them. We're going to have to start thinking somewhat differently. Which is why I present to you, to kick things off, the first of my two pie chart models, which I call the Mercedes model. The Mercedes model is three things that are happening in the human body at any time. Three things happening in the human body at any time. Would you like to venture in the chat box? Would you like to venture? What do you think should be in those three pieces of pie? Round my Mercedes model. Stick it in the chat box. What do you think? Three things that are happening in the human body. Every single one of us who happens to be alive on this planet, I guarantee you, is doing this, this, and this. What would you put? There we go. What are, Sarah, do you mind my asking? What have, what have people put in mm -hmm. the chat box? No, not at all, David. You've got thinking, breathing heart beating, yeah. uh, feeling, and a great one from Diane, questioning yourself. Yeah, good. Well, questioning yourself comes from how all three of these operate together. You're right, thinking. Thank you, Sarah. Thinking is number one. Feeling is number two. And the third is doing. We are always thinking something, feeling something, and doing something, even when we're asleep. Now, why on earth is this a model that would be useful for us to look at? Well, the answer is, there is a line. And the line changes whenever we step out of our comfort zone. So out of those three, under ordinary circumstances, how many do other people get to see of us? And which is it? Stick it in the chat box. How many of these do people get to see of us under normal circumstances? And by normal, I mean when we are calm and collected and comfortable and confident. So again, just stick that in the chat box. There we go. Thank you very much. So the answer is one. Doing. People see what we are doing. And if we are in a state of comfort, then we can typically keep what we are thinking and what we're feeling secret. However, all of that changes when we step out of our comfort zone and start to believe, maybe I'm not enough. Maybe I'm going to be exposed. Maybe they're going to see I'm not that good. Maybe they're, they're going to see I'm not good enough because the moment that that happens, everything changes. What we are doing then starts to reveal to people what we are thinking and how we are feeling. For instance, you might be thinking, ah, oh, I've got a presentation to do tomorrow. Ah, that makes me feel really nervous. 
And the moment you feel really nervous, then boom, you start concentrating on that until the next day, what happens is your body starts doing whatever you have been thinking about for the last day or so. So we become what we think. Just take a little moment to let that sink in and, and think about how often you think that you are not good enough or you think that something is going to go wrong. After all, you know, the most common thought that people have when they're walking underneath the awning of a door that's leading them into interview is don't screw up. And in fact, whilst they've been waiting in a waiting room for that interview to begin, they've spent a full 15, 20 minutes thinking about every single way they could screw up. Which means by the time they walk through the door, their own brain believes that that is what they're looking for and inevitably gives it to them. And I remember I was, I was once years ago working with a client who was the CEO of a pharmaceuticals company and he worked his way up uh, the shop floor to running the company. And it was about 50 people in the company and he believed every Monday morning should begin with him telling everyone in the company from a stage exactly what was going on until one Monday morning, he absolutely froze. And then he passed over to a number two. He went, Sarah, you take over, run from the stage. Poor Sarah was left to deliver a presentation when she hadn't prepared anything. He went back to his office and thought to himself, that must never happen again. So next Monday morning, he stood up on stage and exactly the same thing happened to him. And again, this time he passed over to Sarah, who'd been clever and actually thought of something over the weekend that she had uh, in store. And so it went on every, every Monday until I was called in. And I asked him, you know, what, what are you doing for preparation for these presentations? And it became really clear. He walked over to his whiteboard and he wrote, and it, so give me a thumbs up if it's all right if I use a little grown up language in this room. Is it okay if I use a little grown up language? Super, thank you very much. Um, he wrote on the whiteboard, this must not be shit. And he said, I, I, I come off stage every Monday, I go straight to my whiteboard and I stick that in the whiteboard and then I look at it for a week. So, give me a thumbs up if you are aware that the brain cannot accommodate a negative. And just to prove my point, please do not, do not think of a blue elephant in a tree. You see? Because if you're trying not to think of something, your brain has to create it in order to then try and erase it. So my client here is sitting and looking at the words, this must not be shit, but actually his brain is only able to read the words, this must be shit. So he's staring at this for seven days, thinking this must be shit, feeling, oh my God, this is gonna be shit, which means that on Monday morning, when he stepped up onto the platform to deliver his presentation, his brain delivered to him absolutely what it believed he wanted. Now, again, get, get, raise your hand if you've ever done that to yourself, that you ever in your own brain have created the nightmare that you desperately didn't want to happen. Awesome. So when we work with a voice coach, we do something a little bit different because most people think it begins with, I have a thought, therefore I have a feeling, therefore I do. We start differently with a voice coach. We focus on what you're doing first in order to change your physical state, in order to then change your thinking state, your mental state, in order to then change your emotional state so that when you get up and do that thing that previously you might have felt nervous about, you have a completely different result, right? 
So we're going to begin today with the doing, the physical aspect of it. So here is my second, and I absolutely promise you, my last pie chart. And this is the pie chart of the communication of meaning in face-to-face -face conversation, which was broken down by a couple of psychologists in the 1960s called Moravian and Ferris into these. They said, oh, communication, face-to-face -face communication, simple, it's 7% meh, it's 38% meh, and it's 55% meh. So my question that I would ask you to put in the chat box is, what are meow, meow, meow? What are the seven, the 38, and the 55? What do you think they are? And Sarah, I'd love to check in. What do people put for the seven, the 38, and 55? Do you mind letting me know? Uh, so Laura has put uh, seven words, 38 tone, 55 body language, Annette has joined us and she has said 55% thinking. Ah. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. So look, here it is. Um, Laura, spot on. Words, 7%. Vocal tonality, 38%. And all of the non-verbal behaviour, 55%. Now, the question is, Nonverbal behavior, what counts as nonverbal behavior? Is it just body language or is there more to it than that? Now, if you think there's more to it than that, stick that in the chat box for us, please. Is there more to nonverbal behavior than body language? For instance, how, how you are dressed and what that might say. I, I know from my experience, working at uh, Barclays Wealth that, and working with the directors on the 30th floor of Barclays Wealth in Canary Wharf, that if you're not wearing a tie, you're not allowed to leave the lift. That is if you're a man. And if you're a woman and you have eight pieces of jewelry, you are not allowed to leave the lift to come in and work with anyone. Now it's you know, it's their rules, right? <laughs> I would love to be a fly on the wall that where someone had a meeting that went, well, seven's enough, but eight, mm, that's just too much, honestly. But there you go, it's their rules, right? I mean, we choose what we do in order to work within those rules. What, what else might you consider as being nonverbal behavior? I mean, for instance, who, who has ever had this experience? And just give me a thumbs up if you've had this experience. It, it, it's rush hour. Of course, you won't have had that experience for a while now, but it's rush hour. You're on, you're on a train platform. You jump on a very busy train. There's one empty seat. You rush to grab it. And the moment you've got the seat, you realize absolutely why that seat was free, because the person next to you stinks. Has that ever happened? Does anyone know that experience? Or is it just me? Am I the only one who has had that experience going, oh my God, right? Now, here's the thing. This is predominantly nonsense because this came in in 1967 and it became management consultant speak in the early 80s. And then that's why we had a whole bunch of consultants going around, look, 7% for words. Words aren't important as long as you sound good and you look good whilst you're doing it. Nothing could be further from the truth, right? Because we, because typically we need substance. And, and if you think about recent politics and recent politicians and how much they focus on how things look and sound rather than they are, yes? What happens in the long run is people who don't focus on the words, well, they get found out. So, the presumption that we make with these words is that you know what you are talking about. Well, the trick is to make everything congruent. Now, where this still has validity is in creating first impressions. Now, how long does it take to, fur and to form an impression that is difficult to shift? And again, stick that in the chat box. How long does it take to form an opinion that is then difficult to shift. 
Fabulous. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to look there. I'm just going to tell you straight up that I, there, there, are many, uh, there are many schools of thought. Some say men make decisions after seven seconds. Women make decisions after 14 seconds. And that could be because they're taking more time to look at the whole picture that's in front of them rather than rushing to judgment. But what I actively use are Professor Alan Pease words. Uh, Professor Alan Pease, who wrote the body language book that he rather helpfully called the body language book. And in this book, he says it takes 23 seconds to form an opinion that is difficult to shift. That means you've got 23 seconds when you walk into a room in order to create the right impression. Otherwise, there is is a switch that flicks in the listener's mind. Worth my time, not worth my time. Now the thing is, it's not impossible. If the switch has flicked the wrong way, it's not impossible to get it to switch the other way. It's just difficult. So actually, if we focus on the impression that we make when we walk in to a room or when we enter a, a Zoom room or a video platform like this, what is it you want people to experience of you from the moment that you enter? Yeah, because if we get that congruent, then things will start to work for you and the experience that you have internally will change for you. If we focus on those first 23 seconds. So very quickly, I'm going to tell you who I am and why, you, why you're listening to me here on International Women's Day. Why am I working with women? Well, I'll tell you. I come, that, that's a stage that I'm showing you. I come from the world of theatre. The Guildhall School of Music and Drama is where I went for three years for a professional actor training. Um, I was there with these two. I shared a flat with Ewan McGregor. I'm not giving any dirt away today, but we spent six months sharing a flat together. These two were in my year as well. So I was pretty much surrounded by absolutely the, the cream of young actors in the early 90s when I came to London. Most importantly, I met this lady here who became my first mentor. Now, this lady's name is Patsy Rodenberg. And give me a thumbs up if you've heard of Patsy Rodenberg. Patsy is the world's number one voice coach. Now, she was head of voice at the National Theatre and at Guildhall School when I was there. The reason that I bring her into this conversation is because she was Barack Obama's voice coach in his first presidential election. I know this because I met her in Heathrow. About 12 years ago, when I was off to do a theatre directing job in Germany and she was off to the States and she said these words to me, oh, I'm off to work with this senator called Obama. She then said, the Democrats called, they say this guy's got no presence, this guy's got no charisma. Now, I said, Sarah, you're shaking your head, right? Is that because it's difficult to believe that that is the case? And so I mentioned that not just to be impressive, but to impress upon you that if he can do it, you can do it because anyone can. Everybody comes from a position of not being charismatic to learning how to become charismatic. Now, the good news is that now, 12 years later, if Barack Obama does an after dinner speech, he earns an entire year's worth of presidential wages all of which go to his charity. Does that sound like a return of investment on working with a voice coach, maybe 12 years ago? Right, exactly, super. So when I left drama college, this is what happened to me. I, the only business advice I ever had was just be nice to everybody. And I was nice to everybody and I proceeded to watch people who were less nice than me get lots of jobs and lots of work. And so what happens when you are too nice is you start to become resentful. And often, and the, the reason I bring this in 
is because there are two personality traits that I look at with my clients. In order to be able to <clears throat> helpfully try and find out how likely they are to be financially successful in what they're doing. Because the chief predictors in terms of personality are conscientiousness, the willingness to do that which you do not want to do in order to make your life better, and agreeableness. Now, on a cross section of 100 men, their, their agreeableness quotient will be an average of 41. And in a cross section of 100 women, their agreeableness average will be about 61. And often men use that difference, that 20% difference, in order to dismiss the credibility of women in the room. And certainly, I know my experience, I, at that time when I left drama college, even though I, I feel I was a good actor, you know, when I left drama college, I was pretty introverted. And I did go into that resentment state. And I was able to make a living. Now, I, I learned how to make a living and make some money that would pay the rent or pay the mortgage or make sure my family was uh, was fed until the last crash, 2011, uh, when suddenly I went from earning 3,000 a month to nothing because I was working for lots of other people rather than looking after myself. I'd been too busy looking after other people, and then I ended up wondering, how am I going to pay this mortgage? How am I going to feed my children? And that's when I started investing in myself. Actually, the mo when I had the least amount of money, that's when I started looking for, how do I invest in myself? With these people here, Ian McDermott and Kane Alessia Minkus, uh, who gave me an NLP qualification on top of my voice, uh, I became speakers for Kane and Leslie Minkus's Industry Rockstar. And then I joined forces with the, these lovely people who are my business partners, Chris and Kareem lambert Gorwin. And on top of my own business, I also mentor 300 health and wellness business owners. And with that, that's allowed me to work on stages and work with these companies here, like American Express, and uh, trusts on the NHS as well as Bupa um, and create my unique three-step system. Speak, shine, make 10 times the difference. And that's how we're going to work. We work on making a bigger difference because if we make a bigger difference, the money will follow. And I've just placed here a little testimonial from Beth Redfern, who runs a Pilates company, who's, what she doesn't say in the testimonial is that she's earning 38 times what she was earning when we first met. She had a job at Deloitte that she wanted to leave. She was too afraid to leave it. First, we got her Pilates business to 38K so that she could leave that job without losing any money. And since then, we focused on growing her business, so it's now 38 times what it was when we first met. And she's got both outer and inner confidence out of the work that we've done together. And she also does some work with me. Some of my clients get to work with her as well. Anyway, enough about me, let's get on, because what we're doing this afternoon during lunch, they'll work in three areas. First, inspiring teams. If you're looking to inspire people, down the management chain, or if you're looking to influence people up you in a management chain, or if you want to create a, a, a feeling of advocacy so that people are saying the right things about you when you're not in the room. Because influence is about that, you know, influence is about what happens when you're not in the room. Yes? That's why we're focusing today on posture, voice, and energy. Now, we're going to get down to posture. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to ask people, if you haven't got your camera on, please let us see what we're doing, because I would love to share with you a couple of exercises this afternoon that I believe can be really helpful, that I know can be really helpful for changing the way that you are seen, heard, and experienced by others. So, 
I'd like to introduce to you this idea that there are three levels of energy in the way that we communicate with others. Circles of energy, if you like. So the first circle of energy is the energy that we use when we're talking to ourselves. Who talks to themselves when they're on their own? Good. Not just me then. Fabulous. Okay. Yeah. And so there are times in our life when absolutely we want to talk to ourselves on our own. So everyone, if you stand up and find a space in the room that you are in, please. Can you stand up out of your chair, find a space in the room that you are in, stand with your feet hip width apart, parallel under the knees. Fabulous. And just think about that last time that you had a conversation with yourself. Now, ah, good. So this is what I see in the room. The, the moment we start having that internal conversation, the weight just goes back ever so slightly. And so now we're carrying our weight on the heel of the foot. Yes. So as I carry my weight back on the heel of the foot, suddenly my breath changes. My breath comes up into the chest. And as my breath comes up into the chest, what do you hear is different about this voice that I'm using with you now? Just stick, stick it in the chat box. What do you think is different about this voice that you hear? And, and tell me, honestly, if, if I'm begun today speaking in this voice, saying, hi, I'm David Roylands, and I help senior women get an extra 100,000. Yeah. You'll notice. Ah, okay. So watch this. It's higher. Yes, it's higher. I've lost all of those lower notes. Why? Because I'm breathing from the chest. This, it's quite difficult for me to sustain. So if we go back into that first circle, just put your weight back on the heel of the foot. Just take it back on the heel of the foot and feel where you are breathing whilst you're in this first circle state. Because if you're in this first circle state, who do you need to speak to? Yourself, right? However, many of us will use this first circle state as a default that we go to when we are under stress. And historically, uh, we've found that the first circle is much more likely to be a stress default for women. That just, you know, let's go a little bit off uh, soft focus. Let's go a little bit invisible. Yeah. So that is the first circle. Now, if you come forward onto the toes, get yourself really forward onto the toes, as far as you dare without falling over. Now, this is the third circle. Who recognizes this? Who, who's been in a room that's been led by a voice like this? That's a bit shouty, that's a bit generalized. Ever been led by anyone speaking like that? Fabulous. So that's third circle. Third circle is the typical male stress default. Now, so come forward. If you like, this is examining both fight and flight. So flight, the desire to run away, we go backwards. Fight, we come forwards. Either way, in first or third circle, we are absolutely not present. We have no presence. Why? Because we're big in, in, in here. We're having conversations with ourselves in here. Because in third circle, and if you, again, you come forward right onto the toes. Third circle, you're still breathing in the chest. Now, if I sustain being in first or third for any length of time, I'll hurt my voice. And what you'll find is a lot of male speakers will lose their voices really quickly because they're in third circle a lot when they present. Because presenting in first circle feels quite forceful. So it can be very satisfying for the speaker just not so satisfying for the audience. Because if you like, 
Third circle is the convincing state. It's where we go to attempt to be convincing. So whoever has had that experience of sitting over a table or pushing yourself really forward because you really want to convince people of the idea. Yeah, and what, what typically happens when you go to that extent? It looks like you don't believe in that idea. So between first circle and third circle, there is second circle. And second circle is the position of presence. And we know presence because the breath drops right down into the stomach. So again, if you stand and place your feet hip width apart, parallel under the knees, and see if you can find that place where the breath drops right down into the stomach. And the moment the breath has dropped into the stomach, your center of gravity is inside your body. And the moment it's inside the body and you're breathing low into the stomach, your internal temperature is going down and your heart rate goes down. When your heart rate goes down, the frontal lobe of the brain gets significantly more oxygen. When you're in first or third, then the hypothalamus pulls oxygen from the frontal lobe of the brain where all your clever thinking happens. Who's had that experience that maybe someone in a room is being uh, unpleasant or being forceful with them and you can't for the life of you think of anything to say, but the moment the meeting's over and you're in that corridor, suddenly you think of five, six different things that you could have said in that room. Yes, the French call that the spirit of the staircase. It's very simple. You've been in first circle whilst someone has been aggressive with you and the moment you step out of first circle into second your frontal lobe gets flooded with all that oxygen that allows you to think again so i have an exercise for you i'm going to ask you to watch me do it and then what we'll do is we'll do it together this will help you find out what your stress default is and it will help you to find that second circle position when you need to have presence. Now, I'm gonna ask you to stand again with your feet hip width apart, parallel under the knees, close your eyes, and don't do it now, watch me. Close your eyes, come up on your toes, and then rock through the feet. Now, I'm deliberately going to get you to be off balance. So. Whilst you're doing this with your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to do everything to keep yourself upright. Don't take this as far as you dare, but don't take this to the point that you fall over. Because I can't catch you. I'm not in your homes, right? I'm not in your offices. I want to do this for about half a minute. We take sight away in order that we turn the volume up on the other senses in your body so that you can find that balance for yourself. After 30 seconds, keeping your eyes closed, come back to balance and feel that moment the breath drops right down into the stomach. Then place your head where you feel is you looking directly ahead of you and then open your eyes and then tell me, is the eye line you have now Higher, lower, or the same as your everyday eye line. Okay, have I been clear about the exercise? Yes, give me a thumbs up if I've been clear about the exercise. Fabulous. So please, stand up and find that space. Let's all do this together. There we go. Now. Feet hip width apart, parallel under the knees. Close your eyes, come up on your toes, and then rock through the feet. So you go toe, ball, heel, ball, toe, ball, heel, ball, toe. Just keep going. We're going to do this with the eyes shut for half a minute to give you the opportunity to get off balance. 
We trust our eyes as the chief uh, bringers of the world to us, and often the, the eyes lie to us. There we go. So in another 10 seconds, so that you really feel, take it as far as you dare, but remember to remain upright. Here we go. Now, super, just let it, the arms be by the side if you can, please. Here we go. Now, let's slowly keep those eyes closed, but come back to standing and feel the moment the breath drops right down into the stomach. When you can feel that, place your head where you believe is you looking directly ahead of you. And then open your eyes. Good. Now, tell me. Is your eye line higher, lower or the same as your everyday eye line? Give me, give me, a, give me a thumbs up. Same from Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thumbs up for higher. Clap for lower. Thumbs up for higher. Super. So, higher suggests that first circle is your stress default. Lower suggests that third circle might be your stress default. Yeah. Either way, my promise to you is to create a to create a brand new sense of you and who you are if you did this exercise every day for the next four to six weeks you will change how you stand and how people see hear and experience you and once we got that breath low into the stomach we can start working on your voice because as a voice coach, we divide the voice into three different areas that I call the warrior voice, which is the lower notes, the heart voice, which is the center of the voice, and the head voice, the highest notes that we can do. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Diane. Thanks for that in the chat box. Brilliant. Super. So the thing is, the warrior voice is the voice of credibility. The lower notes. Remember Margaret Thatcher lowered her voice by an octave in order that the men in her cabinet would listen to her. When she became leader, only 3% of MPs were women. So when she became prime minister, she had, she had a room full of men who weren't interested in listening. So she got her voice dropped lower. Now, Let's get your warrior voices going because that represents credibility. The heart voice, the center of the voice, is the voice that we use to uh, build relationship, to, sh to build rapport, to show an interest in other people. And the head voice is the voice of enthusiasm. So in order to get the voices going and massively upscale the energy that we're delivering to other people, I've got one exercise for each voice. Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up if you are ready. Let's do one exercise for each voice. So everybody, I'm going to ask you to stand up and take a position. Where is, you've got one foot forward and one foot back, like so. As if you're pretending to ride a horse. Place one fist on the stomach and one on the lower back. This will enhance your warrior voice and get those low notes working for you. So in a moment, we're going to take a breath in and as we exhale, we'll make this sound and this movement. Ah, oh! Fabulous. So we're all going to do it together. And, we're, and can we, Sarah, can we unmute the whole room, please, so that we can hear everyone do it at the same time? Are we ready? Everyone in position? Fabulous. And after three, one, two, three. 
Oh, oh. 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 fabulous. Okay, so if you do this again on a regular basis, it takes four to six weeks of little but often practice to form a new habit. If you did that one aha daily for four to six weeks, people will hear a different voice and start responding differently to you. And so next, in order to build up that heart voice, who, who'd like to be better at building rapport in the room? Who'd like to be able to build rapport more quickly? Fabulous. So the heart voice is the center of the voice. And we place the fingertips here. So again, if you stand up, place the fingertips here. We take a deep breath, which will, the, the rib cage will open, and that's why the notes will make will be higher. Aha! Beautiful. I can see you all doing it. Aha! 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 <laughs> Fabulous. Now, who here leads teams? and would like the teams to buy into their ideas more. So sometimes we need to get the head voice in order to get massive emotion into a room. So that's when we place the fingertips here. We take a deep breath in and as we exhale, we do this. Bing! Bing! So we weren't expecting that. So it's a bing! Thank you, Diane. Superb. Yay. Now, fabulous. Which voice do you want more of? Which is the voice that, for you personally, you want more of Love. in your life? Love. Is it that warrior voice, yeah. the heart voice, or is it the head voice? What would you imagine will give you more influence in a room? So, stick it in the chat box. I want to know what it is that you want. Because I'm going to ask you to make a warrior. I'm going to ask you to make a promise to yourself that you do do something differently because we spent this hour together. Yeah, lower voice, warrior, warrior, big fans of the warrior. So that getting the warrior going is clearly a way forward. And, and absolutely developing that warrior voice has for many of my clients been the way that they change the way that those other people in the boardroom look at them and experience them. Now, has this been useful? Give me a thumbs up if this has been useful, spending this last hour together. Fabulous. Because if this has been useful, I'd love to make a, an offer to you because, um, because everyone who makes it to the very end, you can get a copy of my ebook, right? Which is, which is called Finding Your Personal Power. I'll ping that over to you straight away. My other offer is, who thinks that half an hour with me, one-to-one, -one, on a phone or in a Zoom room would be valuable? Just like, just like, there we go. Thank you very much. So if you'd like to take advantage of that, could you put yes in the chat box now? I'm offering a gift. I, uh, I charge my private client £750 for half an hour with me. Uh, I'd like to gift it to you, and I'd like to also gift a physical copy of my Amazon best-selling book, Confidence, to anyone who says yes right now in the chat box. Now, if you've said yes in the chat box, you will now be receiving a private message from my colleague Tara, who is in the room. Tara's waving, and she's sending you a private message now which is asking you for your phone number. And that's so we can get you into my calendar as quickly as we possibly can, so I can help you with whatever questions you may have that we can work on in a half hour together. Yeah, it's a complimentary gift. It's actual strategy, coaching. It is not a sales call. If we want to carry on the conversation after the half hour, that is a different thing. Yeah, so if, let, let me know if you have received your message from Tara. And I know we've only got a couple of minutes. At, oh, thank you, Rachel, and everyone who said thank you. Uh, Sarah, are there, are there questions in the room I can answer in the last couple of minutes that we have together? Let me just have a look. Uh, no Any questions? questions? Does anyone have a question anybody wants to put in the chat? 
for David. There's lots of people thanking you, David, and there's yes. lots of people, no doubt, typing their phone numbers off to Tara. Fabulous. Yeah. No, that was amazing. No more, no questions. No questions. Well, this, this, so is the far, of, no. this is the beginning of the journey that changes the mental experience that you have. This is always where I begin with my clients and helping them have a different physical experience that changes the conversation that we have internally, that changes the way that people see, hear and experience my clients so that they're earning significantly more money because they're providing significantly more value. Thank you, David. That was really interesting and uh, very different to the last half an hour we had as well. So thank you very much for that.